is Lori Power, Director of Faith Formation at Christ the Redeemer Parish. Welcome to Talking Saints. I'm here today with my co-host, Pete Sanchez, staff writer for the Catholic Star Herald. How are you doing, Pete? I'm doing all right, Lori. How are you today? I'm doing great. We're talking about one of my favorite saints, Pete. So this is a good day. <laughs> no, it is. Well, I'm glad. You know, we were talking a bit. We, uh, we, we do a little conversation before this conversation. And uh, I really was struggling to really... Um, Honestly, I was struggling to relate to the saint, but I think you, I'm happy that you do, um, because I <laughs> okay. know, I know that it's, uh, sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm glad that there always is a saint for somebody to connect to. That is true. That is true. And I have to say, Dominicans love the saint. And of course, we're talking about St. Catherine of Siena. Um, she herself was a third order Dominican, so she's claimed as part of the family of St. Dominic. <laughs> And I just think she was, Pete used this word earlier when we were discussing, she was intense, but she was intensely in love with the Lord Mm -hmm. (laughs) and that affected everything that she did. Um, So Pete wanted me to share a little quote. So there's a quotation that is used everywhere for St. Catherine, which is, be who God made you to be and you will set the world on fire. But that's not my favorite quote of St. Catherine. (laughs) In one of her poems, she actually says, I am fire. So I just love that. She was fiery. She was passionate. She was intense. And I think sometimes we need that. It like wakes us up. It, it inspires us to just love the Lord a little bit more and to love our neighbor a little bit more. So we need sometimes we need a little Catherine. We need a little fire. Yes, we do. <laughs> to we inspire do. us. So. Like I'm thinking of that song, We Need a Little Christmas. But we Need a Little Catherine <laughs> of Santa. Right. Um, but yeah, actually, uh, last month we talked about St. Margaret Clithero, who mm. died on March 25th. That's right. As it happened, St. Catherine of Siena was born on March 25th. I know, I saw that. Uh, See, no two, coincidences. Yeah, I mean, they're all connected. And But she was born centuries earlier, 1347. And it says that she was the 25th child born to her mother, although during that time they didn't children didn't live very long. Uh, There's a high infant mortality rate. So half of her brothers and sisters did not survive childhood. And even her twin, uh, her her twin sister did not survive infancy. And her mother was 40 years old when she was born. Her father was a cloth dyer. And we're talking about her intensity and her fiery passion. This, uh, this manifested itself from a young age. I guess you could say at the age of 16, Catherine's own sister, Bonaventura, died, uh, which left her husband as a widower. And Catherine's parents were then like, well, why don't you marry him? But Catherine said no, and not only said no, but then began fasting and she cut her hair short uh, as a form of rebellion. Um, but then they even, uh, you know, her... Uh, you know, her parents really wanted her to reconsider. She didn't. And finally, they realized, okay, well, this is what she's passionate about. So they said, okay, you can live as you want. And you can, even, even from, a, you know, from this young age too, she uh, she knew something of the faith because she uh, once said that she regarded her father as a representation of Jesus and her mother as Our Lady and her brothers as the apostles. Mm. And... So um, she had a religious nature, but she didn't enter a convent. And instead, what you said, Lori, she joined the Third Order of St. Dominic, Mm -hmm. which uh, now begins kind of her next phase of her life, living in home. And this was a very strange thing for a 16-year-old woman to do, because the mantellata, as they call them, because they wore the black mantles, um, the Third Order in Siena, they were typically widows. So here's this 16-year-old who um, we will talk about was a mystic. She was even having visions of Jesus from the time she was six, signs up to be or wants to be part of this group, this third order um, group of Dominicans. And they're like, what are you doing? Like, we're all widows. We're older. We're doing this sort of as a second vocation. And here she comes in and, and wants to be part of this, which they permitted her to. But... She was a mystic, so she was having visions. She would, um, people saw her levitate. Um, She even, after receiving communion, would go into ecstasy, which would be like sort of like a trance. So there she would be for hours after receiving communion. So some of the women in in the mantellata were sort of like, okay, this woman is going to bring a lot of attention that we we just want to pray. We just want to live our religious life in this way. Um, So she wasn't 
immediately embraced, I think, by everyone because this of her spiritual gifts. They were um, extraordinary in many cases. And we'll, we can continue talking about that as she uh, became known to the world. But I think, Pete, you had said after she embraced this and became a third Dominican, she did stay at home for yeah. a while, right? Yeah, she did. And she... Uh... And uh, even more interestingly, not only she stayed at home, lived a life of austerity and prayer and contemplation, but she developed the habit of giving things away, <laughs> even without telling her family. Um, so she'd give her f- food and clothing to people in need, and um, but she never asked permission, which is, uh, I guess that's just her way of, you know, she was going to do the Lord's work <laughs> without, you know... Darn it or not. So uh, she was fire. And I th- then, yes, I think so, she had a great love for her neighbor that she did. Jesus made clear to her that that's why you have other people. That was part of, uh, I believe, one of the dialogues. That's her masterwork. The dialogues are really just a record of her conversations with God the Father and I believe with Jesus, but her conversations with God. And she was just writing them down. So if you if you went to pick this up, it is not a systematic um, presentation of theology in any way. It's really just her conversations. And she uses a lot of different metaphors and symbols and images. So if you were to pick this up, it would be a little overwhelming um, if you didn't have maybe a guide to, t- to take you through it. Um, but one of the things the Lord taught her is n- he doesn't give anyone all the spiritual gifts and virtues. No one person has everything you need to to um, sort of grow in the spiritual life. That's why he gives us other people so that they can bring the gifts and they can bring out the gifts in us that we can you know, be more patient, be more loving, be more caring to the people around us. And you can show your love for God by loving your neighbor. So I think that's why she had such a, even, even if she was taking things from her own home, <laughs> because she wanted to show her love for the people who were in need. Yeah. Yeah. So show her love for God by loving those who are in need. And then when she was, so she entered the order at 16, right? And Mm -hmm. then five years later at 21, um, she had something that she called her mystical marriage Mm. to Christ. And some people say there's questions whether she was given a ring. Um, Because only she could see it. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Um, But it sounded like she started it in her own writings, talking about Mm. the ring. And... Now, also, not only because of the ring, but in her vision, she was attuned. She was, uh, she learned of the next stage of her life, which was to re enter public life mm-hmm. and to continue to help the poor and sick. And she immediately went back to her family and started going out into public and started going into homes and hospitals to help the sick. And, uh, she quickly attracted a following. Yes. And I think her, really like her holiness. Yeah. What the, that's how it's people said, attractive. this woman is, there's something different about this woman. Yeah. Um, so she became sort of like a, a spiritual mother, a spiritual, you could even say today we would say a spiritual director. She became a spiritual director for people from all walks of life, like um, politicians and nobles and artists and just sort of your ordinary everyday people on the street, consecrated men and women, nuns. Um, people were coming to her to ask for her advice because they knew of her holiness and that she gave really good spiritual advice. Um, So she became famous not only for um, the work she was doing for people who were sick, the plague happened during her lifetime. So she and those who followed her, her spiritual children, she would call them, were certainly caring for the sick, but also she was just so connected with the Lord that she was able to offer really solid spiritual guidance to people. And that's what attracted her. And I think you mentioned we have over 400 of her letters that still exist. So when people would contact her, that's how she would give them spiritual advice via letter. Interestingly, she didn't learn how to read, I think, until the age of 20 and never learned how to write. So she was dictating all these letters through secretaries. Um, And you can see when you read them, where I might read a couple of quotes from them that you can really hear her voice. It's like she's speaking to the person she's writing to as opposed to writing. And you've, you've, you hear that fire in her yeah. tone, I think. That's remarkable. Too. I, you know, I love, um, I just love reading them because it's, uh, I can see myself in her presence, hearing how she spoke. Definitely. And do, she you was, hear um, the, uh, do you want to hear the beginning of one of her letters, Pete? Def- <laughs> yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> so we haven't talked about this yet, but one of the people she wrote to was Pope Gregory XI, because at this time, 
the Pope, the papacy, had actually moved to Avignon, which is was in France and under the French king. For po- basically for political reasons, this happened, and Catherine felt very strongly that the successor of Peter should be in Rome. So she would began writing to uh, Pope Gregory, begging him basically telling him Jesus wants you back in Rome that's you're going to you're not going to be able to have the spiritual import that you need to have and the effect on the church unless you are doing so from Rome but this is how she begins the letter cuz you can just hear um, her voice through this in the name of Jesus Christ crucified and of sweet Mary to you most reverend and beloved father in Christ Jesus your unworthy poor miserable daughter Catherine servant and slave of the servants of Jesus Christ writes in his precious blood with desire to see you a fruitful tree. So you can tell when she writes to him, she's not doing it as someone who's saying, you know, what you're doing is wrong, Holy Father. You need to get out of Avignon. She's saying, I love you as a spiritual father saved by the blood of Jesus Christ (laughs) and for the good of the church that you could be fruitful. You know, this is what this is what Jesus wants you to do, you know, (laughs) so yeah, she's she was not um, intimidated. She was just doing what even by, you know, someone in the position of the Pope, uh, she was just sharing the truth that God had revealed to her, I think. And, and through all of this, um, she became well, before we talk about what she became um, after she died uh, by 1380, uh, she was 33 years old. Mm. And uh, because she fasted, she became very ill. And her confessor, who was her spiritual director, Blessed Raymond of Capua, was telling her to eat, and she found it difficult to do so. And I believe, Lori, you you found out that she had a stroke, right? Yes. I think shortly before she died, she did have a stroke that left her paralyzed from the waist down. Um, And then she did pass away at the age of 33, just like Jesus. Yeah. Not coincidentally, I think. (laughs) And then, um, so she... It was interesting. You mentioned her spiritual director, who is awesome. Um, the reason Blessed Raymond of Capua was even in her life was because people were questioning her, some of her teaching. So at this time, the, there was a lot of corruption in the church. She was a reformer. She wanted people to be holy. And of course, the people who don't want to be holy aren't going to like that. So <laughs> the this got back to the Dominican order. And at their chapter, where all the Dominicans gather and the, the master general would be there, they um, summoned her to question her. And then they actually sent Blessed Raymond to be to find out, you know, what is this woman teaching? What is she doing in her life? And that's how he became her spiritual director. And thanks be to God that happened because he's the one that wrote... Uh, the first biography of St. Catherine. So he knew her personally. We have a, a primary account, a firsthand account of her life and her teaching through Blessed Raymond. And she didn't even pull any punches with him. She respected <laughs> him, loved him, but she wanted him to go, I think, fight in, um, in one of the crusades that was happening at the time. And he didn't want to go. So like she called him like cowardly or unmanful. <laughs> like she, she even called him out like, Father, you got to go fight for the faith. <laughs> so wow. yeah, she was, she was bold for sure. <laughs> Yeah, but she just had that... Uh, she had the fire. <laughs> had the courage, but the Holy Spirit was in her. And she now, after her death, she became a saint, not only a saint, but a doctor of the church. Yes. And what, what is, for some people who might not know, what does that mean, Lori, for somebody to be a doctor Basically, of the it's someone whose teachings have added so much to our understanding of the faith that we would give them that title doctor of the church so she she's not teaching us anything new but sort of showing us the truth of the faith in such a way that it enriches our understanding so yes she's one of only four female doctors of the church so it's impressive and she be she when do you know when she was canonized i have here then in 1939 she and francis of assisi were declared co-patrons of italy yes but i think that was after they were both already canonized right I believe so. And then 1970, she was declared a doctor of the church. Wow. Pope Paul VI, and right? St. Paul VI named her doctor. I That's awesome. I think so. I can't find anything. No, not yet. I'm not sure when. But yet, she, yeah, at some point, she became a saint and then a doctor of the church. And uh, she's a patron for Against Fire. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> illness, the United States, Italy miscarriages, mm. people ridiculed for their faith, uh, and nurses. Wow. That makes so, sense. Okay. 
Yeah. I'm surprised the United States. She's one of our patrons. Interesting. And that's what this, that's fantastic. I'm glad to yeah, hear that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, hey, we we need all the patrons we can get, right? Yes. And um. All right. Let's see. Any other stories about Catherine that are just so she had great devotion to both the Eucharist and to the precious blood of Jesus. So she used to pray to God saying things like, you who are mad about your creature, true God and true man, you've left yourself wholly to us as food so that we will not fall through weariness during our pilgrimage in this life, but we will be fortified by you, celestial nourishment. So she used to talk to God very um, personally (laughs) and say, you're just crazy that not only did you love us so much that you became man, but then you leave us the Eucharist and then you died for us and (laughs) and shed your blood. Like she was, it was almost too much for her that God would become man and then actually die and shed his blood for us and then leave us the gift of the Eucharist. So I think that's where her fire came from. She had a great, great devotion to Jesus in his suffering and also in the Eucharist. It's amazing that she had such a constant conversation with the Lord through. Mm. That's probably what kept her going. (laughs) Yeah, and that relationship, that encounter, Mm -hmm. which inspired her to help others encounter the Lord in um, that mystical marriage to Christ, which she said would start her so close and where she, uh, so she never married. Well, she married Jesus. She, married she did Jesus. not yes. marry. Well, that's the thing. At sixteen, <laughs> she did not marry she, another man. No. Maybe, <laughs> even, maybe even then, she knew what her path was. I think I so. Think she, yeah, and uh, um, she cut her hair. Wasn't that a sign of asceticism back then? Yeah, cutting hair. Well, at that point, I think she just wanted to make it clear that she was not attempting to attract a man, and <laughs> that's sort of what her parents wanted. But she was committed to Jesus already. Right. Do you have a... Shall we end with... I actually have a prayer written by St. Catherine Sienna. Shall we end with her prayer? Perfect. Great. Holy Spirit, come into my heart. Draw it to thee by thy power, O my God, and grant me charity with filial fear. Preserve me, O beautiful love, from every evil thought. Warm me, inflame me with thy dear love, and every pain will seem light to me. My Father, my sweet Lord, help me in all my actions. Jesus love. Amen. St. Catherine of Siena, pray, pray for, for us. us.